Kauina La. I'm Kauai Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland, kicking off your Pauhana Fridays at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we're going to talk about what the legislature has called the single greatest threat to Hawaii's economy and the natural environment and to the health and lifestyle of Hawaii's people. That is, invasive species. My guest is JC Watson, a planner with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. Welcome, JC. Hey, Kali. Thanks for having me. You know, until um, we started talking about the show and doing a little homework, I really had no idea how huge the numbers are of how these little things affect our economy. Give us some of the highlights. Well, invasive species really affect every everything that we have here in Hawaii, from agriculture to our natural resources, our water, our native species, our birds, our plants, and everything in between. Um, and most of what you see when you go outside is actually non-native species, unfortunately. Um, not every non-native species is invasive, but when they are invasive, uh, they cause harm to, like I said, agriculture, the environment, um, or human health, or the economy. So, for instance, I read something crazy like uh, fruit, fruit flies cost us $300 million annually? Um, I think that's what the estimates are. But, yeah, the fruit fly is um, something that's here in Hawaii but isn't actually in the mainland. So, you know when you go and you fly to the mainland and you have to put your bag through the agricultural inspection? Sure. That's because we have fruit flies, and they don't want those to get to the mainland and be invasive there as well and impact, say, the citrus industry. Okay, and we have some other bad actors here, don't we? Yes, we do. Um, whoa, where to begin? Um, everything from mosquitoes, those are probably the worst in my book, to uh, biting ants like the little fire ant. The mosquitoes are the worst in your book, why? Um, mostly because they affect my everyday life. Um, and they also, you know, native birds are really dear to my heart. And um, non-native mosquitoes transmit avian diseases such as avian malaria and avian pox. And due to those, as well as other factors, is uh, kind of the main reason we don't have a lot of native birds left and why a lot of them have went extinct. Okay, and as far as the um, um, really nasty um, things like snakes? Yes, yeah, snakes are another one that fortunately we don't have. Um, they are found and are detected occasionally, but the uh, Hawaii Department of Agriculture is you know, very, very alert for snake detections, especially the brown tree snake is probably the, one of the, the ones that they're most um, on the spot for trying to locate. Why is that? Um, primarily because there's a lot of commerce between Hawaii and Guam, which is its, the place where it's located, and um, a lot of military traffic. So if it were to come from somewhere, it's likely it would come from Guam. But fortunately, we have a lot of inspectors and out there. What would it do if it came? Well, if it came, um, being that Hawaii is an island system, much like Guam, it's likely to have a lot of the same impacts as it has there, such as uh, biodiversity reductions. It, pretty much ate all the birds on Guam um, due to the density of snakes and their um, kind of their love for warm areas. They cause power outages because they climb into electrical transformers. Um, they're also mildly venomous, so when they bite you, if they bite you, it can kind of be uncomfortable. So while I was doing my research, I came across um, a statistic that was shocking to me. You probably know it. but. Uh, just the Honolulu International Airport handles 21 million passengers a year. That's a lot annually. of passengers. That's a lot of passengers in one. I mean, I thought, oh, I, you know, how big can that be? But we have 8 million people visiting every year. Mm -hmm. But the fact that that one airport is has 21 million passengers, and then we have five international mm -hmm. airports statewide, that's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, it is. So um, you're off, well, first tell us a little bit about <laughs> the Hawaii, what the Interagency Invasive Species Council does. So uh, the Hawaii Invasive Species Council is a really unique um, kind of organization because we're not our own agency. We're kind of a conglomeration composite agency that is made up of a board of, um, I guess you could call them directors, but it's kind of co-chaired by the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. And then we also have four additional seats which are made up of uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Business and Finance, um, 
UH and the Department of Health. Well, it's reassuring to me that um, there is this kind of interagency communication going on um, to handle a problem as broad as this. Mm -hmm. I, it first, uh, during the IUCN was the first time I heard about a very exciting um, development that you guys have just birthed a, a big baby here last yeah, month. Yeah, we have. What is it? So the big news, at least in uh, 2017, is the release of the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan. And that's a long-term plan that's going to start in 2017 and run us through 2027. And it outlines a huge list of goals and strategies for combating invasive species within the state. And kind of um, the way it works is it focuses on pre-border, border, and post-border um, interceptions and um, kind of, yeah, goals and stuff like that. So how in, in the real world, um, as, a, as a citizen of Hawaii, am I going to notice that there's an in interagency biosecurity plan? Well, I would hope so. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> and how, how might I know that you guys are doing your best to protect us from these nasties? Well, um, hmm, that's a very good question. Um, I guess I haven't ever thought about it, what it would look like from the public perspective, um, looking at what's actually being <clears throat> done okay, well kind then. of on the ground level. But, you know, there's going to be some pretty cool things. Um, like I mentioned, the three kind of components of it, but pre-border would be um, maybe more regulations on um, stopping stuff from coming in. Um, maybe screening techniques for, for packages or... Uh, detector dogs at the airport by chance, um, things like that. So those would be things that people could see that um, kind of examples of what Hawaii is doing to stop things from coming in in the first place because prevention is where that's the biggest bang for your buck. You know, once it gets here and gets widespread, that's going to be where the cost comes in. But if you can stop it from coming in, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, JC, as we're coming, when we fly home and we're coming in through the airport and we have those cute little bins, the amnesty bins, do people actually ever use those? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm, Unfair unfortunately, question. Unfortunately, I don't know. I mean, we have our, uh, that little card you got to fill out, yeah. uh, the declaration card, and then the amnesty bins. But the amnesty bins are actually kind of a broader, part of a broader program, which is the Hawaii Amnesty Program, which allows people to actually turn in um, what I guess could be considered an illegal invasive species without risk of prosecution. Okay. So let's say you unknowingly brought in a snake and you had it as a pet and it outgrew its container and instead of releasing it into the wild, which unfortunately people do, um, you can turn it into the Hawaii Department of Ag, no questions asked. Hawaii Department of Ag? Yeah. All right. And is there a number you one could Google. Um, says probably the best. Amnesty, the, yeah. Well, the best number um, I would just call six four three pest. That's the Hawaii Department of Agriculture's Invasive Species Hotline, um, and they're there during the day, and they can kind of help you out with that. I'm sure you could also Google the Hawaii Department of Ag Amnesty Program or something like that. But. Okay. So that six four three pest. That's the one we call when that's we the one hear. You call. Here, when we hear Cokies, for instance, yeah, uh, can, on Oahu, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say. Um, yeah, you can call them for a host of species, but um, you're definitely better to report something and it turn out that it um, is already widespread or that it's not invasive than not report it at all. Okay. Well, sort of interestingly, today on um, Senator Laura Thielen's Facebook page, she had a picture of one of those six-foot iguanas that's... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys get many calls about those in Waimanalo? Um, well, we don't, but I am sure that the Department of Ag gets calls occasionally when they're spotted. Um, the HISC doesn't really have um, kind of response capacity. Okay, so but, that's handled by yeah, Department that's handled by the Department of Agriculture. They're definitely the go-to resource for um, pest reports. So what you guys do, your kuleana specifically in handling invasive species, is what is um, um, so we as an interagency board. Um, one of our primary kind of mandates is that we advise the legislature on invasive species issues. So we being that it's the legislative legislative session right now, we're spending a lot of time at the Capitol um, sitting in hearings and uh, drafting testimony and stuff in support of invasive species bills. And how's it looking? 
Um, actually, so far this year, I don't want to jinx it, but it's looking pretty good. Okay, so um, there we're going to beef up the, the, the dollars that um, are available for invasive species, I hope. Yes, I would hope so. Um, see if I can bring it here. But yes, yeah, so the two primary agencies, which are the Department of Ag and the Department of DLNR, uh, which are responsible for biosecurity, actually receive less than 0.4 and 1% respectively of the total state budget, which is uh, $13.7 billion. So we don't get very much money um, in terms of what we are tasked to do. Do you have a sense of how many people are actually out there responding to um, the invasive species issues? Well, responding, I'm not sure of the exact number, um, but there are quite a f number of people that are out there actually doing on the ground invasive species control work. That's good to hear. Yeah, and yeah. so another part of what HISC does kind of ties into that. So as a, we're kind of a gap-filling sub-agency, um, and we have a kind of an interagency grants funding program for state agencies that kind of, and programs that kind of fall in between the, the gaps okay. of what's mandated in each agency. So and an example of an that. Example an example of that it would be the uh, Island Invasive Species Committees. And um, let's say uh, biocontrol research out of UH or uh, research on um, genetics for rapid ohia death. Okay. For examples. We're going to talk about the rapid yeah. ohia death a little later. But there's a, um, you brought a um, darling video from a student that won about last year's um, Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Week. So we're going to go to a, a, a break and following the video. Awesome. Invasive species affect us by not protecting our water as native plants would. Native plants absorb the water into the soil and save it while invasive plants are not very good at holding it and lets it slip away. Invasive species are wasting the water we use for drinking and agriculture. Some of the most aggressive invasive plant species in Maui are guava, coffee, and ginger. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Okay, we want to tell you about Hawaii, the state of clean energy, which plays every Wednesday from 4 to 4.30. Ray Starling and me, we co-host that show. Dean Nishina is here. He's from the Consumer Advocate. We just had a show. We liked the show. We had a good time on the show. What do you think, Ray? We're going to have Dean back because there's so much going on at the Consumer Advocate's office and there's so much yet to be done to get to our 100% renewable energy goals. What do you think, Dean? Did you have a good time? I did have a good time and I think this is a good opportunity for consumers to learn more because it, it'll be really helpful in terms of moving forward with our transition to clean energy. From your lips to God's ears. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Dean. Watch us. 4, 4 o'clock every Wednesday. You'll see. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas and with me today is J.C. Watson, who grew up here and has dedicated his professional life to um, protecting our Aina in very tangible ways. J.C., um, yes. we have uh, an event coming up that you have been very active in um, organizing. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, being um, that we're getting close to the end of February, it's time to, for, well, that's when I start thinking about Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Week. It's typically the last week of February, and it's kind of a coordinated um, smorgasbord of events that happen statewide, um, kind of in conjunction with the National Invasive Species Council's National Invasive Species Awareness Week. <sighs> that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I've been um, working on that a lot recently, um, and basically what it is, as I mentioned, it's a bunch of events, but it's also kind of brings a focus to invasive species awareness within the state. So what kind of events are, are happening here locally? Um, well, there's everything from volunteer events for people who want to get out and actually get their hands like? dirty. Um, well, let's see. I have a whole huge list. We just had a, let's see, I'll find the 
what, the next one. The next one. So the next one is coming up on February 18th. This one's going to be on the Big Island, and this is actually an Albizia control training and workday, teaching people how to control invasive Albizia trees on their property safely and effectively. Wow. So if somebody wants to look that up, where would they go? So All the, these events. Yeah, so the best place to find it is on the HISC website which I can read off. I'm not sure if you guys are going to post that on the bottom or not. But the HISC website can be found at dlnr.hawaii.gov slash HISC. And then if you want to put a couple more slashes and a couple more letters in there, you can put slash <laughs> HISAW, H-I-S-A-W, slash. And then that'll take you to kind of the main Invasive Species Awareness Week page, and you can find the events list from there. Okay, excellent. Is there maybe a... A Facebook page? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, the Hawaiian Invasive Species Council <laughs> does have a Facebook page, and um, I actually have already posted the lists of the Oahu and Kauai events on there. Wonderful. Excellent. So that beautiful uh, video we saw, we just watched, um, w tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so last year we had a student PSA contest that went out statewide, um, and it basically called on... Um, intermediate to high school, actually I think it was only high school kids last year, this year it's intermediate as well, to create 30 second PSAs on invasive species and their impacts. So that was our first place winner, protecting water resources. It's just beautiful. Um, uh, I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the um, uh, young woman who made that, but um, she did a fabulous job. And mm -hmm. you, um, Ka Kaimana? And um, so you uh, received how, lots of them? Um, well, last year, since it was the, that was actually the first time we had oh. the student video contest, we had about 20 submissions, I want to say, 20, 25. Wow, that's pretty good for the yeah, first year. Yeah, it was pretty good. And then this year, um, the deadline hasn't quite passed yet. Um, well, today's the 17th, so I think they have... Um, till next week, Wednesday. So if any intermediate to high school <laughs> age kids want to pull together a quick video and get it submitted, uh, you can also find the call for submissions on our website. So Danica Brown is the one, is the second place winner from yeah. last week. And we have her video too. Thank you very oh, much. Awesome. Let's yeah. watch that. Hawaii is home to many endemic species found nowhere else on earth. But these species are threatened by invasive species. Some invasive species, such as guava and lilikoi, can block out sunlight or compete for nutrients necessary to survive. Invasive animals, such as pigs and goats, disturb the native plant's habitat as well. We never know where the next invasive species will come from, changing our islands forever. Really well done. <laughs> Really well done. What a great way to get the next generation thinking um, critically about um, invasive species. Yeah. Uh, good job. Thanks. Um, well, good job to the students who made it. Yeah. Um, so in that last uh, video, we saw some pictures of the really devastating rapid uh, Ohia death. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, rapid ohia death, which is um, getting a lot of attention since its kind of um, discovery and um, since it's been spreading so vastly, is a, f it's, it's actually, yeah, so rapid ohia death is caused by a fungus called, called Ceratocystis fimbriata. Um, and that fungus infects ohia trees, particularly, and um, causes them to die so fast that their leaves can't even fall off. Wow. So when they start to kind of have symptoms, a big mature tree can be can be done in a matter of weeks. Wow. Yeah, but fortunately, I guess if you can call it fortunately, is that it is only found on the island of Hawaii. So at least it's not statewide. Do we have any idea of, of how it got here or how it spreads or? Well, the... This is all still being researched, but um, kind of the nearest strain, I guess you could call, of Ceratocystis is found on a um, landscape plant called Syngonium. It's like a creeping vine, so they're not quite sure how it made the jump from that completely different family into Ohia, and that's all being researched currently. So you, you, sh you provided us with a map of some of the places on Hawaii Island that um, it, it 
is found. Yeah, so kind of the epicenter is on the east side over by Hilo and Puna. Um, and this was the map out of, this is kind of the older map. There's a current one being done, but it hasn't been published yet. Um, but it unfortunately has many more dots on it. Uh, are they more widespread or just more dots where there are dots now? Kind of both. It is spreading on Big Island. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that the more you look for it, the more you find. So since it's kind of detection, the DLNR and Division of Forestry and Wildlife has been, you know, really ramping up their efforts on doing surveys. So they've actually been working on doing surveys statewide on all the islands and then doing really comprehensive surveys on Big Island. Okay, but to date, it has not been found on any other island but Hawaii Island. That is correct. Okay. So, um, citizens, um, what can we do? So there's five, well, I, it's going to be six things that everybody can do every day um, to kind of combat rapid ohia death and not spread it around. Um, the first one is don't move ohia off of Big Island. There is actually a permanent, um, I think it's a ruling from the Department of Ag that ohia cannot be transported off of Big Island without a, a permit. Um, and to get that permit, you can contact the Department of Ag. Let's say you want to ship Ohia posts off of Big Island to um, to sell. So oh, that's a that's a really yeah. good. So um, are even if it's a dead tree or or so forth, it, dead wood. Yeah, the the still... dead wood can still harbor the fungus, oh, okay. and the spores um, can actually stay alive in there for quite some time. So it's really important not to move Ohia off of Big Island. Um, secondly, it's it's important not to move ohia logs and firewood around a big island because if you take an infected tree from one side of the island and take it to your home and set it in your yard on the other side, you could potentially pass the fungus around that way too. So ohia is one of one of those native species that's found an incredibly broad range yeah. of. Um, so is the is the uh, rap, is this fungus? Um, confined to one of those um, areas and, and not others, or is it as widespread as the species is? Do you know? Um, well, I can't say if it's as widespread as the species, but it definitely has the potential to impact ohia wherever it grows. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were, you were telling us what we can do. So we yes. could not move ohia. Yeah, not move them. Um, not move them off island, not move them around the island. Um, and then you can also clean your gear. So if you are driving through um, an area where there is ohia or hiking through, you can clean your boots afterwards. You can you know, brush up all that soil because the spores can um, be in the soil a little bit. And if you tromp around to a place where it isn't, there's a potential for spreading it that way. Um, so you can clean your boots, you can clean your vehicles. Um, if you are cutting ohia, for an example, clearing a lot in, in Pune or something like that, you know, it's very important to sanitize your chainsaw afterwards. So if you have to go cut somewhere else, you're not spreading that wood chip around and that, that debris. Um, and then another one is um, not to wound ohia. So that means people who are hiking, um, especially with machetes, you know, often will just tag trees as a way of marking trails. And um, if you tag an infected ohia tree and then tag in a healthy ohia tree, you can pass the fungus along that way. So it's really important to, to do those things and protect our ohia because it's very important. You're involved with the um, uh, combating rapid ohia death, not just with um, your day job, at, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, kind of as, so I wear many hats um, in conservation, so I you know, kind of dedicated myself professionally and personally. But yeah, that's the um, Ohia Legacy Initiative, and that's a nonprofit that um, I helped to fund, uh, found. And um, yeah, basically focuses on creating new populations of ohia and maximizing biodiversity by reintroducing ohias into urban areas. Wow, that's positive and exciting. Thanks. Yay. So it's not just the spread of rapid ohia death that we can help with as citizens, but another one of our bad actors, which you uh, mentioned earlier in the first half, was the little fire ant. Yeah, so little fire ants are, they might actually be a worse invasive species than mosquitoes because, but I don't come in contact with them on a day-to-day -day basis as I do mosquitoes because they are also pretty much found on um, Big Island, especially on the east side. So Hilo's, yeah, getting hit with a one-two punch of rapid ohia death and little fire ant. But they're particularly bad because not only do they affect everybody around them, I mean, they, they bite you. You know, they, they bite you, they fall from the trees, they 
land on you, they bite you on your collar, they bite your pet's eyes and make your um, pets go blind. Wow. Um, they also are very effective at kind of harvesting aphids, so that affects agricultural crops, and then they infest your crops, and if you have farmers, then you go to harvest your crops and you get bit. So it really, yeah, they're, they're very, very nasty. And um, fortunately, they're not widespread on the other islands. There are small populations on Maui, Oahu, and Kauai, but the Department of Agriculture, the Hawaii Ant Lab, and the island ISCs are working very, very hard to contain those infestations and eradicate them. Uh, the, the island what? Oh, the ISCs, the <laughs> <laughs> Invasive Species Committees. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Well, in the last two minutes, um, perhaps you can tell us um, a way that we as citizens might be um, instrumental in uh, stemming the tide of these nasty little things. Well, um, probably the easiest thing that you can do is test your property. And it's fairly simple. You just get a, like a popsicle stick and put some peanut butter on it. And you can do more than one. You just kind of put them around your, your property, around your house or your building or at work or whatever. I don't think anyone's going to mess with a popsicle stick covered in peanut butter. <laughs> um, and you leave it out, and about an hour later, you pick it up and you put it in a plastic bag, and you throw that plastic bag in the freezer. And that humanely kills the ants. And then you can send that sample to the Department of Agriculture, and they'll actually test it. Wow. Okay, that's a fun little project. Yeah, it is. A little weekend project with the keiki to test one's environment for little fire ants. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, is there some kind of area they like to inhabit? What, where do they sort of come um, They really like to be in foliage and in trees. Um, they thrive where it's wet, but they can also live where it's dry. Uh. Um, and so far there hasn't really been an elevation gradient that they can't live in. Um, Hawaii is, you know, we're such a beautiful habitat that when species come here, they can really just take off. And if they're nasty like the little fire ant, they have no boundaries. Thank you so much, JC, for coming and giving us a little taste of what the Hawaii Invasive Species Council is doing to keep us safe. and. Mm -hmm. Um, our beautiful Ina, um, and thanks, I just want to say personally, thanks for, <laughs> you know, picking such an awesome course of study. You studied at UH, and yeah, yeah and great jobs in conservation. Mm -hmm. It's really um, important for other young people here to know that there's a great future, even if you stay at home. Absolutely.